All right, church, how we doing this morning? We doing all right? We doing well? Hey, I wanna take this opportunity to welcome those that are watching online, especially our Rescue House North family. If you're new to our church, you may not know this or not, but we actually have a campus, a Rescue House campus, outside of Boston, Massachusetts, in Lowell, Massachusetts, where they meet at their local YMCA, and they tune in every single week as a church and as a congregation. Um, And we just wanna pray special blessings for you, Rescue House North. Uh, We love you guys. We pray that the Holy Spirit is with you. And so we want you to know you really are our family, and uh, we know the Holy Spirit is not limited by a location. And so can we just welcome in our Rescue House North family all the way up in Boston? Come on, we love you guys. A couple of things that are coming up is next week we start a brand new series called At the Movies, and we do this every year. It's our highest attended series of the year. It's the perfect time for you to invite somebody to come and to experience Rescue House. This is where we take popular movies, and uh, we extract biblical principles from them and preach God's word, and we show some scenes from the movies. Uh, It's a lot of fun. We have a lot of Coke. We have a lot, like, like, you know, that we pass out, like popcorn. We have candy. Um, It's just gonna be over the top awesome, and so it's a perfect time for somebody that is close to you, uh, but maybe far from the Lord, to invite them to come and be a part of this. Anybody want to know what the first movie is next week? We're going with Top. Top Gun Maverick, somebody, it's gonna be awesome. So, let's go. Get your aviators ready. I'm giving you permission to wear your aviators to the house. All right. And uh, we're gonna spin it, we're gonna extract some biblical principles, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. Another thing that's gonna be a lot of fun, like Pastor Chris said, is our Christmas season. Okay, so I wanna make sure you're joining us for all of those experiences, especially what he talked about, our Christmas experiences, December 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. Listen, we're going over, like, we're blowing it out of the water this year. The last couple years, we've done some Christmas Eve uh, candlelight stuff. We'll still do some of the candlelight traditional stuff. It'll be good, Uh, but we're taking it to another level. We got some special guests that are coming in uh, to be a part of this, Um, and I just think you're really, really gonna enjoy it. You're gonna wanna be a part of it. Come to multiple nights, invite multiple nights, multiple people. Uh, Make sure you got your family here. Um, Again, it'll be December 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. They're identical worship experience, so just pick one if you want. Come and bring a bunch of people. Uh, We're going to have a blast. It's going to be awesome, okay? Uh, One of the things that when you become a part of Rescue House, we say is we're not inviting you to a church service. We're not inviting you to even really an experience. We're inviting you on a journey, and I believe that God wants four things for our life. And I can show you in scripture, and I have showed you in scripture, I don't have time to do all that today. But the first thing that God wants you to do um, is for you to know him, for you to know God. The second thing that God wants you to do is find freedom, freedom from the things that's holding you back from being who God made you to be. The third thing he wants for you is for you to embrace your purpose, the very reason he put you on planet Earth. In other words, you weren't just here just to kind of live day to day, you know, 60, 70 years and just kind of paycheck to paycheck, just drudging through life. That's not what he has for you. You are destined for greatness. He doesn't want you to live a life of survival. He wants you to live a life of significance, okay? And in order to figure that out, you gotta go through him to do it, to do the fourth thing that he wants, and that is to make a difference. So we say around here, we're inviting you on a journey to give us, give us a year of your life. Go on a journey with us to know God, find freedom, embrace purpose, and make a difference. And I promise you, your life's gonna change in the most incredible way. But we want you to know, first and foremost, that the ultimate purpose of my life is to make a difference. It's why you're on planet Earth. And and the problem is, a lot of times we kind of know that, and I think deep down there's a a seed of that in our hearts because we're made in the image of God that we know we're here to make a difference. But the problem is the gravitational pull is towards selfishness, is towards me and mine and kind of hoarding and things that that, that, that I feel like are mine and I earned. And so we really just kind of live a life that's, all about me, and I'm here to tell you, and I'm pastoring a church, and I want to shepherd a church to say, hey, this life is not about me. My life is too small of a thing to give my life to. At the end of my life, I don't want to look back and say, well, I stored up a bunch of treasure for myself. I, you know, had a bunch of, you know, great possessions and created a lot of wealth. That's, that's not, that's not jo- a joy-filled life. It's not why Christ died for you. 
The goal for you is to live a life that's all about others. And so for two Sundays every year, we do a series called Legacy, and we're in the part two of that this year, where we pause and we remind ourselves, we have to kind of come back to, it's kind of like a recalibration, a resetting of this life isn't about me, it's, it's about other people. And we use the holiday season to just ramp up our generosity, because it's one of the darkest times of the year, not physically, or not just physically, but mentally, and for a lot of families, and we want, they, the darker the world, the brighter we Christians get to shine, and we shine with our generosity. And so we call this season Legacy, and, and when we focus on, uh, you know, other people, um, we understand that that's the very definition of legacy. Legacy is what people remember once you're gone. It's what people's going to say about you at your funeral. It's what people say about you at your 80th birthday. And legacy is something I want for you. I want you to leave a legacy that not just your children can be proud of and people can be proud of, but a legacy that God can be proud of. One that where your life makes a, an ultimate difference, but not even just a difference, but an eternal impact that shows up in heaven when you get there. Here's some promises from God's word in Psalm 111. Very, very powerful. It says, good will come to those who are generous. What, what a promise there. Good is going to come to those who are generous. So those that have, live open-handed, that God gives them resource, time, talent, treasure, and that flows through them, and they don't just you know, pray, God bless me, bless me, but God bless me so that I'm a blessing for other people. I wanna be a blessing. God says good's gonna come to you, and, and, and for those that live freely, they, here's the second promise, they will be remembered forever. And that is legacy, all right? Proverbs 11 says this right here, a generous person will prosper. Now, I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher where you give God a dollar, he gonna give you $10 back. Give him a $1,000, he gives you $10,000 back like he's some math equation. That's not our God. But I'm just reading to you what scripture says, that if you are generous, if you give freely, then your life is not gonna be free from pain. It's not gonna be free from trouble. In this world, you're gonna have trouble, but take heart for Jesus has overcome the world. But you will be able to look back on your life and, and know that God prospered you, that you are prosperous if you're generous. And then it says this, which I love this, whoever refreshes others, guess what? You yourself will be refreshed. And I just want you to be a refreshing person, a person that in the community and people, are, people see you coming down the aisle at Walmart and they know they're about to be refreshed because of your personality and because of what God's deposited in you and you're so grateful and you just have an attitude of joy and the same mindset as Christ and you're a person that other people are glad to see coming, right? We've all had those people where it's like you see them at Walmart in the line and you're like, oh, I'm gonna, I don't need milk that bad today and you like go to the like, next line. Like you don't wanna be that person. <clears throat> You want to be a person where they, they, they see you, and it's like, man, I'm so glad that I ran into you today because you just, you're, ref, you're refreshing. And those people, when you refresh others, the, you yourself, God will refresh you. And so every year, at the end of the year, we give you an opportunity. It's not a mandate, it's not a command. It's just an opportunity for you to live this out and to be generous and to give above and beyond your tithes and your regular, regular giving to the legacy offering, which goes to our legacy lanes. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But we come together, and, and here's what I say, is I don't give you a number you should give. I, not even collectively, here's a number we need to give together or a goal. Or, I literally just want you to talk to God and ask him in this season of your life, at the level to which God's been good to you, say, hey God, I just want you to impress a number upon my mind. God, would you just make it clear and press it upon my heart as to what you would want me to give five Sundays from now? Because I don't like high pressure, manipulation, 
coerced type giving, right? Where it's like, you know, we get Becca to sing in the arms of an angel on stage and show some like, you know, stuff and try to like, oh, you really need to get, or, or you know, like, man, you know, we really need money at this offering because we need to keep the lights on and we need to pay the bills and that's just not me, all right? Um, it's, and, and that's not what I want for you. I want you to like want to, I want you to have like a, a, a cheerful heart where it's like you get almost like five weeks from now when we come to give this offering, you're not walking in here and be like, man, this is really gonna hurt my bank account. Like, or, I, you know, I, I, I don't really wanna give, but I guess I'll give out of, out of obligation because the preacher said so. Or even, even I don't want you to give, and I say this hesitantly, I don't even want you to just give out of obedience. I mean, I do, but I don't want you to stay there, you know? And listen, there are times when out of faith and God says to do it and we don't feel like doing it and we do it out of obedience. That's a part of our faith, it is. But I'm telling you, God doesn't want you to just stay there. He wants your heart, not just your behavior. He wants your heart, not just your money. I mean, I mean imagine if your spouse said to you, you know, I've never really cheated on you, but, you know, I've had the opportunity, but, you know, I, not really because I care about you, but, you know, because there was this law that says don't commit adultery, so I didn't do it. <laughs> and they were faithful to you because of the law, but not because of their love. Right. And that's what I'm saying today is God wants you to give out of love, not because the law or commands it or... He wants generosity to well up inside of you to where you get to, where it's an honor to, where I'd love to because of what God has done in and through my life. I just, I can, I'm showing up five weeks from now ready to give, excited to give, passionate to give because of what God has done in and through me. Let me show you this in Philippians it says, dear friends, you always followed my instructions, all right? So you always did what I asked you to do, right? When I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show your results of your salvation. Here it is, obeying God. So there is a sense of obedience here. God tells you to do something. You do it. You're obedient with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you, So I want you to see this. When you're obedient, when, when, when you do things because he told you to do it, that's okay, okay? That's a good starting place. But as you do that, check it out. He's not done with you. He wants you to go to another level. So he begins to work in you, giving you the desire. So, so now he's, he's kind of giving you like a passion for it. And excitement for it. Like, like, I, like I, oh my goodness, I, I get to do this. The desire comes. And then the power, and you can replace that word power with ability. So as he gives you the desire to give, the desire to serve, now he gives, starts, starts giving you the ability. Then he starts giving you more resources and more wealth so that you can continue to do what pleases him. And when you're faithful with the small, then he just pours back into your lap and he can trust you with the big. This is the difference between grace and law, okay? The law was the Old Testament, and under the Old Testament, it was like, you know, hey, you give 10% of your income back to the Lord as soon as you get, you know, 10% of everything, the first 10%, and I believe in the tithe, and I believe that principle follows through the New Testament, which is grace, all right? But I don't believe that it's just like a you know, strict command, like you gotta do it because of the law. Like, like I believe, I truly believe that Jesus says to tithe, so, so we're gonna do it. But we move into the New Testament where we shouldn't just do it because God said to do it, but we do it because we're in love with Jesus. Here's what I would say to you, and this is just me being honest. In five weeks from now, when we take up this offering, I don't want you to give out of obligation or guilt. I don't. I would, I would rather you just, just hang on to your, like, don't, don't give. I would rather you fall in love with Jesus first, fall in love with 
what God is doing at this church second. And once you have a heart for that, then you bring an offering that would be acceptable unto the Lord. Fall in love with Jesus first, church second, and then you give an offering that, that, that you can just be excited about, that you can be a cheerful giver. Again, this is the difference between internal motivation and external obligation. Internal motivation is the I want to, I get to, it's an honor to, thank you so much, a heart of gratitude. External obligation is I guess I have to, you know, I guess I got to, you know. I feel kind of guilted into it and everybody else is going to give so I guess I need to like give something and that is not the heart that God wants you to have behind a gift that you would give to him. He wants your heart, not your money. He wants your heart, not your behavior. In 2 Corinthians, Paul was taking up an offering for the church in Jerusalem and they were one of the poorest churches in Jerusalem, and he had kind of been making his way, and he had just come from Macedonia, which was north of Greece, and now he's writing to the church in Corinth, and he's challenging them and saying, hey, let's take up an offering for the church in Jerusalem, and I want you to watch his language when he's trying to inspire and write to the church in Corinth about taking up an offering. Check this out. It says, and now, brothers and, and sisters, we want you to know about the grace. So he uses the word grace instead of money, resources, wealth. He says, I want you to know the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches in the midst of a very severe trial. So in other words, they were facing economic issues, famine, like they were struggling economically, and yet their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty, check it out, welled up in rich generosity. So it was actually their extreme poverty, it was the famine, it was the struggle that they were going through, actually that produced a welled up genera, genera, generous heart, wow. which, is, which is like incredible. And, and you think about this, like, <clears throat> like a joy-filled heart is not a happy heart. Happiness is circumstantial. When we're on the mountaintop, we're happy. When we're in the valley, we're sad. But that's not what he's talking, like it's possible here to have <clears throat> an overflowing joy when you have nothing. That means that everything you have, none of that will produce a life-giving joy. My gift is not missions, but I have been on several mission trips. And I have been to third world countries where these people have nothing. But you know what the, I, I noticed that they had more than me? The joy of the Lord. Because their joy was not circumstance. Their joy did not come from wealth, money, or possessions. And I would even venture to say that many of them were more generous than I was with their time, their talent, and treasure. And this is what I, this is the church I wanna pastor, is a church that, gets inspired by God and and so grateful to God and generosity just wells up inside of them to to the moment where they they cannot wait to give. Like it's just so exciting. The next verse says this right here. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able. So they just gave everything they had and then check this out and even beyond their ability. I mean, beyond what they thought they were even capable of, they just gave, and they were happily, happy to do it. It says, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service. So they're sitting there going, thank you so much for letting us be a part of this offering. I just cannot believe you let us give to this. It's amazing. It's awesome. For the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. I mean, again, this is Rescue House Church. This is what I'm challenging us to do. Not because we have to, not because we got to, not, you know, but it's an honor to. And I'm excited. And it says this, they gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier, made a, a beginning to bring also to completion this, here it is, act of grace. That's the offering. That it's, an, it's an act of grace 
on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnest, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. And that's what I want for you. I want to encourage you for the rest of your life to excel in the area of generosity. And I'm telling you, the more you give, the more God puts back into your lap. He does. And again, that's not prosperity. That is the Bible. And I'm not saying it's always going to be money and it's going to be in your bank account. But I'm telling you, he's going to have his hand of favor on you, those that, that are givers to what pleases him, to his church, and to his kingdom. He goes on to say, I am not commanding you. I am not commanding you, and neither am I. I'm not commanding you in five weeks you, got, you have to give. I want you to pray and ask God. If he tells you to give zero, you give zero. You just do what the Lord tells you to do. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnest of others. In other words, what he's saying there is, I'm, you know, I'm just... I'm not commanding you, but I'm just letting you know, Macedonia, they gave a lot, and you, like, he's kind of comparing them, trying to create a little bit of a, of a game there. He says, for you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. Can we just talk about this for just a second? He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Can I just ask you a question? You think Jesus wanted to go to the cross for you? The answer is actually yes, he did. Now, did he want the nails? Did he want the beating? No, he didn't want any of that. You know what he wanted, though? You know what he was glad to do? The Bible actually says it was the joy set before him to go to the cross for you. You know who the joy was? You were. So yes, there's a sense in which Jesus wanted to go to the cross. It was an honor to go to the cross. It was a get-to opportunity for him to do that for you. Obviously, he didn't want the nails. Obviously, he didn't want the beating. But what he wanted more than all of that was he wanted you. And you were on his mind before he took his last breath. And, it, and it's his gift to you. His body was broken for you. His blood was shed for you. That was his gift to you so that you could be forgiven of your sin, so that your righteousness would come from him and your sin would be cast as far as the east is from the west. He goes on to say, and here's my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give but also to have, check it out, the desire to do so. So here's what he says to the church in Corinth. He was like, everybody else, we took up an offering and they gave, they give out of obedience, some of them out of obligation, but I want you to know, Corinth, that you were actually the first to have the desire. And that's what God wants for you, it's what he wants for me. He doesn't just want us to give, he wants us to make sure that we have the desire. So he says, now finish the work so that your eager and willingness to do, <clears throat> do it may be matched by your, your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness, you see this language? For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable. So what makes the gift acceptable? The willingness, the, willingness, the heart. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to be generous. And I'm telling you, good comes to those who are generous and lend freely. So when do we become the best givers? When do we come, you know, really just our hearts turn to generosity? Let me give you three quick points. The first one is, is when I'm grateful, not guilty. So like, I'm not gonna stand up here and try to make you feel guilty 
and giving to the church. The world will do that to you. The world will look at successful people and go, you got a lot and uh, you, you really should give all of that away and like, you know, you're successful. And I mean, politicians do that. Uh, the government does that. It's just they, they look at successful people. I can't believe you're successful and like you should just like give all your stuff away. Like some, you know, church does some of that as well. There are some people that believe that, you know, you've got to live impoverished, in poverty and you got to give everything thing away and just live, you know, and I don't think that that's true. I think, I think God gives you wealth and, and gives you blessing, not for yourself, but so you can be a blessing to other people. And so if you have wealth and you are successful, God has his hand of favor on you, but he's asking you to spread that and to give that and allow that to flow through you. So it doesn't stop with you. It flows through you and you are a blessing to other people, but I'm telling you, you give at a high level. Like we, we become really generous people when we understand we're blessed and we're grateful versus like feeling guilty. You, you gotta understand like I feel like the Lord has blessed our church, maybe more so than maybe some other churches, but I don't feel guilty about that. I feel responsible and I feel like it's our responsibility to steward what God has given us well to give back to our community. And our, our church is known for giving to our community Amen. and to serving our community. When pe pe first thing people think about Rescue House in our community is that church gives a lot of money away. They give a lot of service away. They are community-minded. They, they are there to make their community better and bring heaven to earth. Come on, church. That's what we do at this church. And so I feel responsible, and we give because we're grateful for what God has given to us, and we feel blessed. And that's how David felt in First Chronicles. He said this right here, David, praise the Lord. This is right before they take up a big offering. David, praise the Lord. And Israel was the most wealthiest nation when this was written. So David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty. You see, he's just like praising God for the wealth that they have, the resources that they have, and the splendor for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. He's just saying, it's all yours anyways. I just get a chance to steward it. I don't, I don't have the wrong perspective that some of it's mine, some of it's yours. No, it's all yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I? You ever feel that way? Who am I? You look at what God's given you, your children, your family, roof over your head, cars to drive, jobs, business, and you go, but who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Do you see the heart of gratitude there? Like, I'm so grateful I get it. Like, who am I? Like, we, the fact that I even get to give an offering of this size and this magnitude is just blowing my mind. Everything comes from you, and we have given uh, you only what comes from your hand. What a great perspective today. And so we give best when we're grateful, and we're not, we're not guilted into it. And I'm just not gonna be that pastor that, guilts you into or try to manipulate you into giving. I just, I'm telling you, I want to shepherd a church where generosity just wells up inside of us and we're grateful. And out of that gratitude and heart of gratitude, we give to the things of the Lord. Number two, when we become a generous givers, our best is when I love people the way that God does. When I love people the way that God does. In other words, when I'm not focused on like projects and but when I'm focused on people, it's, it's one of the greatest ways we can show God that we love him is how we love people. And the first, uh, in the New Testament church, they did this so well, so well. Check this out in Acts. It says they devoted themselves. So, so there was a devotion there first. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
Everyone was filled with awe and the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. In other words, they're one heart, one mind, right? They were together and had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They took care of one another, which was powerful. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is how the church grew. It wasn't through some strategic plan. It wasn't through like, you know, making sure we had a video board and lights and contemporary stuff. Like, no, no, no. You know how God blessed them and and grew them, generosity. They just shared everything. If someone was in need, they made sure they had that need. And that's what the church is for. We see two chapters later, some of the same uh, language here. All the believers, these are the New Testament believers, they're some of the first believers. All of them, one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land and houses sold them, brought them money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. And we are a giving church that takes care of our people, that takes care of our church, and takes care of the community. I could go on and on for days. I'll just share a couple with you just in the past year of what we've been able to give to. One is we were able to give $8,000 to our first global mission trip back in July when we sent them out to Honduras uh, to do uh, housing projects down there, a VBS for a church, and partner with an organization down there. Uh, And and there's more of that to come, more global missions. If that's on you, like, hey, we're going to go again, I think, this this coming summer. And so be praying about that. Uh, But we were able to give $8,000 to that. We were able to give $10,000 to 50 kids uh, who are underprivileged school kids who wouldn't have been able to get school supplies, uh, new shoes, um, you know, new clothing. And so we partnered with YMCA's Bright Beginnings, gave them $10,000. We didn't just give them the money. We put servants along with the kids who were able to share the gospel with them, who were able to talk about Jesus, to tell them, hey, this is from Jesus. It's not from me. And so we were able to come and we were able to give $10,000 to those children. It's just powerful. In fact... Over the, uh, over the last 12 months, we've been able to give to our school system, Davie County School System, over $16,000 in partnering with them. A couple months ago, a Hispanic church uh, were kicked out of their lease um, in a shopping center here in uh, Davie County. And they had nowhere to go. And so some men in the church caught wind of that. And they said, we'll build you a church building. And so you know what we did? We gave them $2,500 to that initiative to help this Hispanic church because you know they're gonna be able to reach people that I'm not gonna be able to reach, that maybe you're not gonna be able to reach. And we were able to give them uh, $2,500. We were able to come beside of uh, Pastor Chris and his new initiative to plant for the city church in Winston-Salem. And we were able to give him $10,000 up front so that he can plant that church and we can send him out. We were able to give $1,000 to celebrate recovery at Blaze Baptist Church. So we're we're a kingdom-minded organization. Like, we're not... We're not just all about, oh, what God's doing here at Rescue House. We we know God is not limited by these four walls or limited by location. We're a big C church with with a mentality. We were able to partner with our sheriff's department um, and their Shop with a Cop program. You know, in the last few years... Man, it's been very hard to be a police officer 
and they've kind of gotten a bad rap, you know, maybe a few bad apples have kind of ruined the reputation of many, and we want to help them with that and let them know. We partner with them. They keep us safe every single Sunday here, and we wanted to partner with them with $1,000 to help them uh, go and take a kid and shop for Christmas for them and let them know that, hey, the, 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 our, our sheriff's department, our, they are good people. They keep the peace. Like, we need police officers, and we honor them in our community. We were able to give $1,000 to a Davy Pregnancy Care Center. When many of these moms come in, some of them are, are in the beginning are wanting abortions and they're able to walk beside of them and kind of kind of get them out of that mentality and then help them along as they have the babies. And so we're big partners of Davy Pregnancy Care Center. And then just a couple weeks ago, we were able to give, um, we were able to buy a, a used van for Tiffany um, and we spent $9,000 on this used vehicle. Were y'all there for that? Was that, that was, was awesome? And um, she actually filmed a video where she just wanted to thank you. So let's go back to that moment. Turn your attention to the screen and check this out. Said it's going to be a good, a good day. It's going to be a good day. And I was like, yeah, it is going to be a good day. Little did I know what was going to happen. So I was serving the kids' house in Ta Town, and I had turned on service so we could watch it. But just as Pastor Matt was speaking, Chelsea pulls me out of the room, and I'm walking down the hallway thinking she's showing me something that Krista was doing. And I walk through the doors of kids' house, and then I see Riley, and I was like, "There, something's going on here." And I stepped backwards. I was like, "Y'all are about to put me on this stage in front of people, and I have no idea why." walked me to the stage and I had no idea that that blessing was about to happen. I was, I had no idea. And so the slow reveal of the red curtain and then, and then the van, uh, it just hit me. Because if it wasn't for the community here, sisterhood, and having the support that I did, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be where I am today, just being able to plug in and have the opportunity to do that. That's what Rescue House provides for us, having the opportunity for not only me to plug in, but my kids to plug in. Um, for you to give, even if it's a dollar or however much, you giving gives someone like me hope to know that God's working through you and you're helping provide something, you know, as simple as community for the kids and I, um, showing the example. Um, I just say thank you. Thank you, Rescue House Church. I love you. Pretty cool, pretty cool. And so we are able to be a generous, generous church because we plan to give. Every, every dime that comes into this church, we give away 10%. So we, every time, every month, we just set aside 10%, 10%. We just put that aside so that when needs come, we're able to fulfill those needs in our community and meet our community's needs. I, I had this vision one time that um, I wanted us to have such a presence in the community, such an influence in the community, such a, you know, we were so generous that if Rescue House Church ever went away, the community around us would almost like flip out and lose their mind because we have that much influence because we've been so generous. And I wanna continue to shepherd a church like that. And so when you give, uh, whether it's your tithes or offerings, or especially this legacy offering in five weeks, it goes to four places. We call this our legacy lanes. The first place is missions, all right? Again, that's 10% of every dime goes to local, national, and global missions. Local is our community, national is our state. Uh, so a lot of times we're partnering with Samaritan's Purse, and then globally in Honduras and other opportunities in the future. All right, so uh, it goes to missions first and foremost. The next 
place we really like to sow investment into is our next generation ministries. This is birth through 18 years old. We want them to grow like Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, favor with God, and favor with man. And so we put a lot of resources. We don't just have a student ministry. We are a student ministry. And we believe in the next generation. We believe they're the generation of today. We're a, you know your generosity. I wish sometime you could just come on a Rise Up uh, Wednesday night and watch the youth lead worship to their peers. It is just, like, I was blown away. I came in here uh, a, a couple months ago. I was here on a Wednesday night, and I just stood in the back, and just tears went down my face because I was seeing students lead students. And when you get students leading students, like, man, it is just like, what? Like, I, I couldn't believe it. So we really believe in the next generation. The next thing is our families. So we, we invest in, you know, we've done marriage conferences before. We do uh, women's nights, men's nights, sisterhood, brotherhood. All of that is to, you know, really invest in the family. We do child dedications. We really hone in on the family because we want you to have a Christ-centered home. And then the last place is, is our church is our campus here. So in the last 18 months, we've been able to do a ton. We've been able to, you know, get the atrium wall uh, done last year. We were able to resurface the parking lot. Uh, just a couple months ago, we were able to put window tinting on. We were able to do a new audio for our broadcast for Rescue House North and for all those that are watching online. We were able to purchase this LED video wall so that we could put the gospel on display at a high level that would engage you and connect with people who are lost. So there's a lot of things that we have been able to do. Our next big thing is our youth room and our dream team headquarters that we're believing God for. And the reality is we move at the speed of your generosity. And so like, I'm not like in a hurry. I'm not like going to coerce anybody to like step up and like, you know, nope. As you pray and as you, God calls you to be generous, like we'll complete that at the speed of our generosity. And so that's the next big thing that we really believe and want to get done. Um, and we're believing God for it. The last thing that I'll tell you that when we, we become uh, great givers, when we become very generous is simply when I fall in love with Jesus. And again, that's why I love the Christmas season because the next several weeks, we're just gonna focus on the greatest gift that we were ever given. It was a baby boy born in a, in a manger, but he wasn't just a baby boy, he was a king in a cradle who would eventually give his life for you and for me. And I don't know, I just kind of feel like David did in Psalm 116 when he says this right here, he just says, how can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? You ever feel that way? Like, how, do I have some, how can I ever give anything back to you, God, that would be a worthy gift after everything that you have given to me? I think about my children. I think about my family. I think about, again, just the resources, the memories, the moments. The Lord has been faithful, and the Lord has been good. John Bonnell says, this right here is one of my favorite quotes. He says, if one first gives himself to the Lord, all other giving is easy. In other words, when you fall in love with the Lord, when you fall in love with Jesus, the giving becomes easy because your heart is there. And that's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21. He says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, so if you, wherever your money, your wealth, your treasure, your time, your talent, wherever that is, your heart always follows, okay? So I can tell where your heart is by looking at your bank account and your bank statement because your heart always follows your treasure. So let me spin this a little bit and, and, and here's what I would say and here's what I would ask you. Where do you want your heart? Where do you want your heart? And as you answer that question, if it's the things of God, if it's the thing that pleases God, you want your heart there, then guess what? You gotta put your treasure there. Whether you feel it or not, just put your treasure there. And the heart always follows generosity. The heart always follows the treasure. And so as you 
give to this church as you give to the kingdom of God. And if this isn't your church, you give to your church. But as you give, the places you give and the places you invest, that's where your heart will end up. Because heart always follows treasure. And Jesus said it best, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So where do you want your heart? And you know, this whole giving thing, God says, I want you to be a cheerful giver. I want you to love doing it. And I want you to know that when you give, I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna pour out so much blessing on you that you don't have room enough to store it and to handle it. If you'll just let my generosity flow through you to other people, I'll give you more. You give to me with a spoon and I'll give back into your lap with a dump truck. That's what he does. And I've witnessed it over and over again. I love this scripture. I'm gonna read it to you and Riley, you can come on out. Riley's gonna come help me with an illustration, but it says this, give and you will receive. That's a promise. If you'll give, you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. So you're gonna get what you gave. You're gonna get it back in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount, don't miss this, the amount you give will determine the amount you get back. I, uh, a couple months ago, I got my little baby girl, she's five, her name's Merrick. I got her a pack of Skittles. I mean, what a good father am I, right? You know, they go through the line and they always want something, right? And they totally forget that you just bought them something and they're on to the next thing. But as a father, my little girl, she get what she wants. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just being honest. The boys, not so much. The girl, girl, you can have whatever you want. You know, they, she's got me wrapped around her finger. And I, I, I bought her a pack of Skittles and we get to the car. I open, I open them for her and, um, and she's eating them and we kind of get down the road a little bit. And I said, hey, Merrick, can, can daddy have a couple Skittles? And you know what she said? She said, no, they're my Skittles. <laughs> well, excuse, excuse me? Do you not realize that your father took his hard-earned money, right? <laughs> and he bought you some Skittles. And now you're going to say, no, no they're, they're, they're all mine. They're my Skittles. What she didn't realize and what she doesn't know is daddy's got a credit card. And dad's got a debit card with a bank account. And I could buy her all the Skittles that she would ever want in this life until she is sick of Skittles. And I'm telling you, in that moment, if she would have just given me a couple of Skittles, then hey, next time she asks for Skittles, I'm gonna give her some Skittles. Because I'm telling you, when you give to the Father with a spoon, he gives to you with a dump truck. And he just continues to give, and you give a little bit more. And he continues to just give. And eventually, in this life, he's gonna give it until it's full. And then you know what he's gonna do? He's gonna shake it down, and then he's gonna give some more until it's like running over, until it's in your lap. And then, come on, somebody. Until he's just giving to you. Hey, that is a picture. Listen to me. That is a picture of what God wants to pour out on your life. He'll never do that for you with clenched fist. Ever. Hey, stay still over there. It's very hard for Riley to sit still, but you're doing a good job, Riley. I just wanted to show you in a fun way how God wants to bless you. And if you'll give to him, he'll give it back to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, running over in your lap. And you have an opportunity in five weeks to give to the things of the Lord and to give to his storehouse here. (laughs) 
Hey, you can go on. <laughs> hey, let's give it up for Riley. Oh! Are you glad you came to church today? Come on, let's be a generous church where generosity wells up inside of us, where we're grateful to give. We get to give. It's an honor to give. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done in my life. Let's give him some praise for what he's done in our lives. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for just your heart, your generosity, that you gave your one and only son for us. God, we celebrate that this Christmas season. We want you to know we love you. And God, we pray for our legacy offering five weeks from now. We pray that we would just talk to you. You would impress upon our heart and our mind and that, and that we would give exactly what you would want for us and for this church, God. God, we, we don't want manipulation, being coerced, guilted, Father. We, we, we want to be obedient to you, God. But God, I pray that you would make us cheerful givers. That joy, joy filled givers, God. And God, help our church to continue to be a blessing. I pray that we are faithful with what you've given to us. We've stewarded it well. We'll continue to just share it in Jesus' name, Father. And it's in his name we pray. And everybody said, hey, one more time, let's give him some praise. Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if it has, would you consider partnering with us financially? You can do that simply through giving through the Rescue House app or making a donation online at our website. And you too can be a part of helping others discover who God made them to be. And if today's message impacted you, would you share it with a friend or a family member? And lastly, if you're in the area, we would love to meet you in person. So join us next Sunday at our Moxville campus location. Now, go be who God made you to be.